Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is a mastery empowerment course, healing and discernment in the age of empowerment. We are here with seer and scientist Elizabeth Wood. Welcome Elizabeth. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Really proud for everyone. Got lots to do today. <laughs> Yes, this is a really powerful time and, and we are saying that if you are here and if you are watching this, this is your empowerment and we hope that you're feeling this empowering time with these creator energies. So let's sit back and listen as this beautiful Elizabeth Wood shares this wisdom from her teachers and her inner wisdom and guidance. Thank you, Elizabeth. Ah, thank you. So I'm going to get to really di dig deep today into this, these two topics, healing and discernment, which are my very favorite topics, really, to discuss. And they're very pointing at the moment because we've just switched from one big paradigm to another. And we're the transition team, and that's really huge. So the transition is from this power over paradigm. And what does that mean? Well, lots of different layers of control, layers of power. And many of us know how it feels to feel like you're in control and how it feels not to be in control. And that big paradigm shift from who has all the control is moving, it's shifting. It's moving into all these individual peoples, you as a soul, being empowered as a unique part of source, being empowered as a unique part of source to be able to heal yourself, to heal your body, to heal the collective, and to heal some layers of reality that I'm going to talk about a little later in our class today. And so that healing piece is key. You don't have to be a healer to make healing one of the most important parts of your reality. And so the discernment part is also key. How do we know when it's appropriate for us to be in a position of empowerment? We're not going to have power over anymore. There's not going to be the same dependency anymore, especially from healers and those that need to be healed. There's going to be a co-creation of healing. And so we're going to be watching the crumbling of all the systems right now that maintain power over. We're literally in the middle of it at the moment. And it'll continue to unfold from here. A lot of people say, oh, there's, this is the new normal. No, no, we haven't got to the new normal just yet. We've got some work to do to get to the new normal. And the new normal is our, our souls being in charge of our bodies and what we manifest, what we create, how we heal, how we co-create. Culture starts from the individual up. So you're looking at your inner self with some of the things I'm going to teach you today. You looking at your inner self first is how we start to change the world. And so many of you are advanced in this concept of manifesting. And if you aren't sure about that, I'm going to add some pieces in that you might not have heard before that will help you to really understand how manifesting works when it comes to this new level of empowerment. And listen, we're creating this from here. This paradigm is starting within us right this moment. It's not fully manifested in all the systems and structures and ac economic political structures. It's not fully manifested in the material just yet. So we're doing the very first part of culture change by shifting our belief systems first, by recognizing that we need to have a mindset change. And then we're going to manifest into the 3D that big, man, that big mindset change, it's going to be a paradigm change that sparks changes on every level of culture, including the material. So I'm basically empowering you today to be able to start 
with massive global change. And I'm giving you the exact tools to be able to create that change, that paradigm shift in yourself now. So let's begin in the mindset change part because we're gonna use all three of our brains, the brain mind, the heart mind, and the gut mind along the way. I'm gonna cover exactly what this mindset shift is. It's a cultural mindset shift, not terribly easy to do when you've got to change a lot of your beliefs. A lot of things are shattering. A lot of the ways we are normally working in our world has to change. And that's tough for us, but we are painted into a corner at the moment. This change must happen. So as long as we're not in resistance, and we're willing to keep playing with this path to a different paradigm, this path to an empowerment paradigm. As long as we keep playing with that mindset shift, the rest will come into place. So the first thing we need to do is realize, okay, we're at the very beginnings of this change. It's not gonna be perfectly laid out for us just yet. Culture change is a massive effort. And that is the biggest reason why we're present here in these bodies anyway. I'm also gonna talk about how to discern because as you're going along the, every day, you're going to be asking yourself some questions and your mindset shift, and you're gonna be wanting to know the answers. Well, you're gonna find answers all over the place. When you have a framework question, you're gonna find those patterns and answers everywhere. Anytime you're asking to find something and you ask your brain to do so, it runs that program of finding that pattern in the back of your mind all the time and you see it everywhere. It's kind of like if I told you uh, to think of a duck and think about ducks today, you're going to start seeing ducks <laughs> wherever you're at. You're going to find them. You're going to find ducks everywhere. The brain's great at finding these patterns. So we're going to use that because the brain mind's really handy at finding patterns. We're gonna teach the brain to be looking for patterns that are gonna support you in then of course discerning. You need to discern the truth. What is the truth? We're given all sorts of information all the time. How can we discern the truth and also still value different points of view that we might not agree with? That's empowerment, isn't it? Because in empowerment, Everyone is in a space of equanimity. Everyone is equal in their vantage point being important. No matter how old they are, no matter what their body's capabilities are, no matter what, say, ethnicity they are or background. And I really mean that in that our little children really can have an honored vantage point. All of our elders, they can have an honored vantage point and we don't necessarily have to agree with each of them in order to discern the truth and then stand in the truth with gentleness. So I will show you how that discernment works. I'm also going to talk to you healers specifically. While I'm not going to teach specific healing techniques today, I am going to speak to the healers and how you can be changing the way you're working in subtle ways to create more prosperity for everyone that you're involved with, including yourself, and to be able to start manifesting these mindset shifts in the way you work so that empowerment is the foundation of your reality all the time. And the last thing I'm going to really talk to is what needs to be healed right now. We need to get really clear about exactly what that is because a lot of us have healing tools. There's tons and tons of wonderful healing tools, but what do we apply them to at the moment to make this big paradigm shift more effective and faster? So that's what, something I'm gonna label at the end before we take questions. So let's go into this mindset shift because it's really different. It's different and I'm talking real culture change here to get to the age of empowerment. I'm gonna say something that might seem really weird at first, so bear with me. Consider probably the most important and most asked question that I've ever been asked in my whole entire life from anyone who needed to use my gifts as an oracle and a seer. 
what is my purpose? People ask this question every single day. What is my purpose? Why am I here? It's the most important question to the average soul because they do want to know why they're even here. What is the reason? And then a lot of times, including people like me, especially me, we give them a purpose. Most of the time I answer people with the same answer that the purpose is to learn to grow to evolve right to learn to grow to evolve to learn from the challenges and the good times and to continue to bring more information into the source field that the purpose of the universe is to discover what is love and what is not love and in discovering what is not love to find love there that sounds all really great. It sounds really nice. That would be good enough for some people. They could start from there and then they could start to ask a lot of times, well, what's my personal purpose? What do I really want from this experience? What am I trying to learn? Is usually the next question, right? But I wanna point out an inherent problem in the concept of purpose and the way we have used it and how it relates to power over. When we ask someone, what is my purpose? We are giving them the power to choose for us in that moment, their purpose. When we ask, when someone asks me to talk about the future, what's their future gonna be like? Other people might have told them a future, and my answer often is the same. No, I won't do that, because that would be me picking a timeline for you. And I don't have the right to do that. Instead, I want to empower you to create the timelines you want in the moment. So I bring them out of the future, and I plop them into the now, and I say, here's how you start working on creating your future. Now, the concept of a purpose is the same idea. That when we ask, what is my purpose outside of ourselves? We're giving power to people like me, psychics like me, or different kinds of healers or different teachers or gurus. We're giving them power to choose a purpose for us because of what they're perceiving. And so they're running that information about purpose through their ego, through their trauma, through their learning as a soul and their bodies as well. This is what I do. This is what we all do. We run this information, this light through it in order to determine what the answer is to a question. So it's always biased. Any answer to what is my purpose, what is my future is always biased. The only truth is going to be inside of you. So first, I want you to ask yourself in this moment, what is the general purpose that I've come up with for myself? I'll use myself as an example. So I, re I realized it was probably going to be a verb, right? It's going to be an action. I've picked a purpose in this life and many lifetimes as a soul. And that's to know I'm, I'm obsessed with knowledge. I've lived my life incredibly embroiled in every layer of knowledge I could get my hands on and wanted to absorb it, to be it, to be the one that knows, right? And so if you can ask yourself, what is it that I'm here to do? To know, to love, to bring hope, to communicate, to sing, to write. All these different actions, right? Maybe, maybe there's a myriad of actions that you feel you're here to do, to heal, right? To protect. Ask yourself now, can you let that go? Because any clinging on to a timeline about the future, any clinging on to a purpose, it limits us, it's a box. 
to know is actually a box. It's a box that says, well, if you don't fulfill your attempt to know and what what limits are there to that? <laughs> if you don't fulfill your attempt to know, then you didn't fulfill your purpose. And that creates a great fear in all of us, doesn't it? It creates a great fear that we won't fulfill our purpose. And that's a trap. It's a trap. Purpose is a trap. So feel this with me. If you shift this purpose out of the way, and say, you know what? All the actions are available. All of these actions are constantly available in the moment, but I'm not going to frame my future and keep it in a box. I'm not going to only pick one timeline and say, that must be it, it has to be that one. And if it's not, then I failed. That is not true. That doesn't fulfill the goal of growth and evolution, does it? Because Growth needs to be full and complete. It can't be boxed in by a single concept about the future or a single purpose. In fact, all purposes are simply a myriad of choices in front of you each moment. And each moment that purpose can change. And so let's allow ourselves to be free of trying to hang on to the power over our own purpose, the power over the future that we actually don't have. We don't have power over the future. Where's our power? It's now in this moment. So I want you to just be with me in this moment. Let's do this mindset shift right now. And we're gonna do a heart command to help us do that. The, the heart's gonna talk to our brain and talk to us about this. So we'll say, dear heart, Please lift from my consciousness any clinging on to a specific timeline, any clinging on to any specific purpose, lift all of those out of my consciousness so that I can be in the now where all my choices and actions are. Do this now and then take a big deep breath. So when we say that out loud, we're telling the subconscious and all the cells with the beautiful frequency of the voice, what this mindset shift is and what you just did is you gave your brain a chance to catch patterns. So let's talk to the brain really clearly. Dear heart, please tell my brain mind to look for all the choices in the moment all the actions in the moment that I can take so that I can remain in the present and catch my mind wandering into the future or worrying about the future as I go from here. Do this indefinitely and take a big deep breath. So again, we're using the heart mind who can talk to the whole body and all the cells because we want the cells to hear us. And we're talking to the brain specifically too, but because we're saying it out loud, that's gonna percolate into the subconscious. Now, you might have a little cognitive dissonance happening at the moment, maybe, maybe not, about purpose because boy, we've been nailed with this for years and eons about purpose and how important purpose is, right? Again, I told you that's the number one question people ask me. And it's a smart question, right? Because they're trying to bring value to the moment. They wanna have some kind of concept they're working with in each moment. They want some kind of image of the future. We are taught and programmed specifically to leak our energy into the future. It's called the field of limitation around time. And that program, it's literally a program, keeps you worrying about the future. This question, what is my purpose? It does the same thing. It's almost akin to asking a child, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? Suddenly their whole child disappears. Their whole childhood disappears in that one question. What do you want to be when you, when you grow up? Suddenly they can't be a kid in the moment. They have to choose a future. 
instead and here's what we can do for ourselves around purpose it's no different the feeling the energy of that question we're going to ask ourselves each moment what do i love right now if we ask a child what do you love right now it cultivates their chance to ask them what do i really love what do i want what do i need right now not 10 years from now now it cultivates our concept of using all the power that we have in the moment in these body machines, this beautiful biological technology to use it to our great advantage. And that, of course, is going to be evolution, which was the whole point in the first place, right? <laughs> so then we're not blocked to true evolution. Very good. So then I want to give us a chance to be in the moment and then and then what <laughs> and then what then what do we do we've got to ask ourselves a few questions about our time about how we're spending our time right so in that moment we have perhaps a million to-do lists i know i do for sure and this is why i had to readjust my mindset in this so this is what i did and i'll give it to you as an example, I realized, okay, I find myself stressing out a lot about my giant to-do lists. I mean, there's just incredible amounts of them and it's impressive. <laughs> um, my friend calls them miracle lists because it's a miracle if they ever get done, right? <laughs> so I realized if I shift out of purpose into the now, and I ask myself, what's the myriad of choices that I can choose from, then I feel overwhelmed because there's so many things to choose from. So I figured out that I needed to use my body to help me filter through that giant list of choices so we could get into the real work instead of sitting there being overwhelmed, wasting my time wondering which thing I need to do. So I said, oh, I'm going to use my three brains to help me out with this one. So I asked my, my, myself, I asked myself as the soul in charge of my body, how does my brain feel right now? Where's my mindset at? Am I too tired to do something complex? A am I feeling creative? Am I feeling like I really need to get some of the more challenging things on my list, like taxes done? knowing that I'll feel better when I'm finished with that work? How am I doing mentally? Am I feeling triggered? Am I overly emotional? Maybe my head feels foggy and I'm not hydrated or I haven't eaten enough. So I asked myself, where's my mind at at the moment? I even did that right before this call. Where's my mind at? So I, I found myself wandering around and all these different things. And I had to bring my mind into the moment, keep asking, where's my mind at? Right? So you're asking your brain mind where it's at so that you can use it to your advantage, but that's not the end of your questions. Where's your heart space at? How are you feeling? Are you feeling triggers? Maybe they're yours. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're the collectives. Maybe they're your family members right? How are you feeling in your field? Does it feel heavy? Is there a lot of stuff in the field? Do you need to do some clearing before you can do anything and start chipping away at your to-do list? Checking your physical heart field. And then the last mind is the gut mind. How's your body feel? Do you, are you in pain? Do you have any issues at the moment that need to be addressed before you can be clear enough to do something. Are you hungry or thirsty? And we can ask our different brains, hey mind, how are you feeling? Heart, how's it going? Gut, how are you? And your body and these three minds are going to help you. They're gonna give you clarity about where you're at. They're gonna help you make those little adjustments to be able to decide what you're going to do now here's the problem with this if you're a workaholic like me i will do everything but rest 
And so you must include resting. I, I included eating and drinking, didn't I? But we've got to include resting as always an option. Where's my brain? Where's my heart? Where's my gut? Is my body tired and actually I'm not realizing it? Am I anxious because I'm actually tired and I need to rest or meditate? So we include all the ING words, the verbs, the resting is doing, resting is doing. We must include that in our myriad of choices each moment. And then we have, of course, this broader idea of, well, all the things that I'm doing in my to-do lists are there to help me to know more and to help others to know more. That's remained the same, but am I relegated to only working with knowledge? No, definitely not. I'm not relegated to that as a purpose. That can change too. Some days, everything I'm gonna do in that day has everything to do with healing myself, which I'm getting better at. Healing yourself is one of the most important parts of this work. So, that ought to be on the table too. Am I healed right now? Do I have some healing to do right this moment? Am I feeling blocked or triggered to a point where I can't do the other things I want under the umbrella of to know or to teach or to embody or whatever it might be, right? So we do need to constantly be aware of what levels of healing we need to occur. Very good. And so then the other thing that you're going to notice too is what is in your attention. When you're looking at the now and you're trying to use the now and all its power, what's in your attention? And source will bring all kinds of interesting things to your attention if you are aware enough to ask that question. What's in my attention right now is a beautiful set of a hundred people who are hearing my message at the moment that's in my attention so i ask myself who what or where is in my attention what people places or things are in my attention let's say you're in your office and you ask yourself that like the other day, I asked myself, what people, places, or things are in my attention right now? My kids were out of the house. My husband was out of the house. I was all alone. And I could feel the presence of the collective. And so I asked myself, what does the collective need at the moment? Right? Because that's another question we constantly are asking ourselves in the now. What does my mind need, my heart need, my gut need right now? What do I need as a soul right now? We ask that when we're working with people, we're healing. What do you need as a soul, as a body right now, right? So we can ask the people, places, or things in our field, even if they're not right there. Of course, I can't speak to the whole collective all the time, right? But the collective can speak to me. I can feel the collective. Many of you are collective empaths, so you can feel the collective all the time. So I asked myself, what does the collective need right now? And I heard it loud and clear. We need tools to help heal ourselves. So in my to-do list is publishing this book called Heal Yourself and Heal the World that my friend Meg Archambault and myself created. It's a whole program, and we were so excited about it. So uh, it's the first book I'm publishing through my new publishing company. And that had a whole bunch of to-dos that I needed to address in a timely manner, but little tasks, you know, to make sure that each of those were gonna be done right. Did I tell myself in that moment, knowing that that matched what was needed, the collective said, we need healing tools and I have them and now I need to make them ha make it happen so they can access this. this. This was a great, use of my mind, heart, gut, and my body, my intent in them now. So then as I'm going through, I did not give myself a time to work on this. 
I said, I'm just going to keep working on these tasks, laser focused with my intent to get these tools out to the collective. This is my laser focused intent. This is my purpose for this moment. And so I'm visualizing the collective receiving these tools as I'm doing the little back end deeds that I needed to do to make it work. And all these little steps, I did not visualize how it was going to feel when I was going to be done with it. I did not visualize being finished with it. I visualized in that moment, the even bigger aspect of it, which was the need that I was meeting in that moment, the need of the collective for healing tools. And so I could see them in reception as I was doing every single click and every single form and whatever it was in the moment. But I didn't say, all right, I'm, I'm only giving myself 30 minutes to do this. I decided that when it felt right to be done or when the surrounding situation in my attention changed, then I'd finish with that task, however long or however deep I got, right? And then, of course, what happens? Uh, my husband interrupts me um, and he gives me some lunch that he bought, right? And that was Source saying, hey, your attention now needs to be on this person who's giving you something. Big, huge, very focused brain mind, right? Suddenly having to change their envisioned purpose in that moment went from giving the collective healing tools to eating this sandwich, right? <laughs> Where's my mind? Where's my heart? Where's my gut? My body said, yes, this food would be good. So now my attention has changed. What's the person, place, or thing in my attention now? A sandwich and my husband. I'm giving you real life 3D <laughs> examples of reality, right? So this is very laser focused. This is really constantly in the now. And you are not considering these big, huge timelines that are actually constantly changing. You're not worrying about it. You're not putting a bunch of energetic into it. Instead, you're in the moment co-creating with source with whatever person, place, or thing is in your field, right? Now, I want to um, point out that consent is very important at this point. Because if you're in co-creation with anything in your field, the, it's come there because it needs some attention by you. And if we do any changes to the person, place, or thing, we need to have consent. Now, in that moment, of course, the collective showed me what was needed and by asking what do you need right now how can i help you right now and the collective saying i need healing tools that was a way of getting consent now i didn't say can i work on this because the collective couldn't answer me back properly right or a lot of different places and certain things aren't going to be able to answer you back properly if you ask a question like that so we need to allow consent as part of our reality by recognizing that if it's in the attention, if it's in your attention field, if that person, place, or thing is in the attention field and you ask them, what do you need right now? It could be the land, it could be your garden, it could be your pet, it could be your lawn. And then you get this clear action that you can do in that moment and your mind, body, heart is in the right space to do it. Because you've asked it and it's in your attention, it allows the consent to exist. So the lawn says, um, you know, I need watering right now. And then you're going to take an action to meet that need that need through the answer is the consent. Now, if we're not sure about that, then we ought to ask, right? We can ask. 
we might not get a perfectly clear answer from certain people, places, or things, but we can ask, how does this feel when I'm envisioning or I, when I state, I want to water you right now, does the lawn suddenly take back the need and say, no, not right now, right? Or does the project or the collective I say, you know, I want to help you right now. Do they suddenly say no? So unlikely, probably. But if you're not sure about the consent, ask the person, ask their soul, ask the animal or the plant. Okay, well, this is what I'd like to do to help you. A lot of times they might say, yeah, but if you do it this way, then it'll be more effective and then we co-create and you can co-create with plants animals people places things consciousness is and everything and so you can ask them you know is there a better way when i state that i want to do this this way and you state it out loud even if it's an object is there then does it appear that there could be a different way to do it that might be more effective. This is how we can co-create, right? So maybe the plant says, I do want you to water me, but I'd really like it if you'd activate the water. Whoa, I didn't think of that. I could give my plant activated water. Well, that then was a co-created action in the moment. It was a co-created action in the moment and it did not create dependency. It created co-creation. It empowered you and the plant to use the energy in that moment in the now more effectively. This is the, that then expounded to the global situation on the planet is the paradigm shift I'm talking about. And it's in that one little example, but then extrapolated to all our relationships. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying this is a brand new paradigm of empowerment. Because the nature of the relationship with all people, places, and things is consent. And then, of course, you're working to co-create the answers we're co-creating the actions in the moment we're not just doing it alone without guidance no one can you never do that's the illusion your body's a symbiotic machine you're never doing anything alone you're doing it with bazillions of bacteria and viruses and cells and all this incredible intelligence that's animating your body and that is co-creation all the time. All the cells have to be in the right mindset. So when you ask yourself, hey, mind, hey, heart, hey, gut, how are you doing? You're even asking consent from the bacteria and the cells of your body. You're asking your body to co-create with you as a soul. That's the shift I'm talking about. Good. I think we've got it. All right. So. Once, once you've stated your intent and you've co-created then the action in that moment, you're gonna be also considering any vantage points, any viewpoints. So if you're in a team, right? Maybe you're in a team, you're working with other people or you're in a client situation. Maybe you're the client or maybe you have a client in front of you that you're serving, right? Then you're always going to recognize and put yourself at this higher level vantage point outside the body regularly. The bird's eye view of the situation can help you to maintain the now. It gives you a chance to be the witness and say, am I speaking from my soul or am I running all of that info through my ego and my trauma? Am I really functioning as a soul in charge of the body? animating the body, using the body wisely in co-creation. How's this person doing in front of me? Am I, when I'm talking to them, are they really overrun by ego structure, including trauma, perhaps, right? Maybe they're stuck in a story and they're just so traumatized. 
they don't even realize that they're a soul who's stuck in this story, right? They're, they are not the story. And so I'm just using an example. So then you can ask yourself, can I try to speak to their soul? Can I get the needs of their soul revealed right now? And the best way you can position yourself in that vantage point is going to be to imagine yourself above yourself and the other individuals, the other people, places, and things in the situation. Imagine yourself above it. Ask to be shown anything you're missing and ask out loud. If I was to ask your soul right now what it really needs, what would you say? So we really do have to try to help the people around us to not function from ego and trauma because they are not their bodies. They are not their their ego. <laughs> Those are just things they're using and learning from, right? What are they really? They're the they're the consciousness animating the body, the soul. We have this wonderful concept which is very true so you're empowering the soul to be in charge then when you ask it that way what's your soul really want not the hurt version of you what's your soul want for the hurt version of you let's co-create with your soul and the hurt you and me let we're going to co-create an answer together what do you really need as a soul? What does your hurt version of you really need right now? Right? So when we're able to ask these questions in this way, then it really helps us to maintain that vantage point and honor all vantage points because they're going to have their own vantage point. Everyone does. And the tricky thing is, is we're all really programmed to imagine that everybody else is thinking the same way that we are. I'm weird enough that I knew that wasn't true early on. <laughs> but we tend to imagine that people feel things the same way we do or think about things or define things the same way we do. And that's, that's of course, not true. And so it's not going to help us to create real culture change when that's going on. So I want to just point out that then asking yourself this final question, this one last question, is there any dependency that's been created here? And that's a really important question, especially for healers to ask, because a lot of times healers are taught to go in to come up with a solution, not necessarily co-create it with the person's soul and the person's traumatized self and the person's ego perhaps too. Then they come in and we come in with tools and we do removals. We do activations. We do different kinds of activities where we're healing people and we are not giving them the tools to do it themselves especially with removals, especially with activations and different kinds of healing. We don't create the chance for that person instead to learn the tools to do it for themselves. And that's a subtle thing that we all can shift. That's very subtle because it is part of the dependency that a normal uh, economy based on competition would do right but that's not the economy that the new earth is going to work from is it it's going to be co-creation it's going to be empowerment that means that everything we do and the way we offer things is going to have to change big time so as a healer you're there to radiate health and in that presence of health, help people to understand what their true needs are, what their bodies, egos, minds, hearts, guts, souls, needs are, right? You're the magician that can ask the right questions to reveal what is needed and then co-create tools and co-create methodologies. I found myself with very specific people taking the same tools that I've taught over and over and over again and modifying them in the co-creation with their soul's needs 
in order to help them meet their needs faster in a more effective way because there's no one size fits all. And so although I could go in and like remove their bad feelings and their stuff and all this quite quickly, most of us as healers have found that this will end up often coming back. I've done removals of entities and you name it, all kinds of things for e ages, perhaps eons, <laughs> but ages at least, at least a couple of decades. And with that, I always found that the attachments would come back. They'd feel good temporarily, but without the tools to manage it themselves, that stuff would always come back. People would clear it, but they wouldn't learn really why the attachment happened in the first place and how they can prevent that and how they can heal themselves in the moment. And when I started to modify the way that I did that, then that stuff didn't come back because they knew what to do. And this did not ever lose me clients. It never lost me prosperity. It's the opposite. People would stick around because they'd trust me. They'd value that I was going to give them the tools and say, you can do this. You can see, feel, and know the truth. You can do this. You can heal. And let's keep working at it. Let's keep experimenting together. Let's keep co-creating the solutions. We're going to tweak these techniques that maybe they've been around for ages. We're going to tweak them just this way for your soul's needs. This is going to be the big change that we can implement, especially as healers and anyone who engages with the public in general anyone who's teaching anybody even if you're writing whatever it is in creation we can keep asking ourselves am i cultivating the empowerment of all the people places things around me am i cultivating empowerment am i creating dependency and in nature everything's cradle to cradle so dependency ends up shifting because the rain will fall and allow the plant to grow because that is part of the base basic need that that plant evolved to have. We took the plant out of that position in nature and we put it in a pot and we created dependency. Now that plant and I He's de it is dependent upon me. And I'm not saying you can't have house plants. <laughs> I'm just saying that that's a lot of responsibility. And when you have hundreds of clients who are also like potted plants, they've been taken out of nature, haven't they? We've all been taken out of nature and now we're dependent on these systems. We're dependent on these systems that are crumbling that are corrupted. We are no different than the potted plants. I am dependent on these systems. And I have now allowed myself as a soul to work diligently at removing my embodiment and my activities from the systems. And this is how you can start. You can start by being the one giving the tools and people will come back to learn more and they will come back to keep getting access to your advice and your support. They won't disappear because suddenly they know everything. That's not what happens. And in fact, for me, I keep going out and finding new people to learn from, to learn more tools from, because we're not finished ever. We can keep co-creating and being able to give people access to new tools and we can keep evolving. It's the end of competition. Then I can say, you know, I just listened to this certain webinar the other day and uh, because I'm a student as much as I am a teacher, right? And that's the case for all of us. And what this person said was so profound. What if we played with that idea and modified it a little for your situation? How does that feel, right? And that's another way as a healer that we can keep maintaining this prosperity. How does that feel when I give you this idea 
How does it feel to you? Then you're co-creating from the soul's needs. You're making sure they're continuing to be empowered and responsible for their own feelings and being willing to ask themselves the truth of all of that, right? Good. So I did kind of skip ahead a little bit and I want to go back to how do you discern stuff? How do you discern what is true? What are the needs that you're having? Is Are those real? A lot of people are afraid that they're just making this stuff up. And first off, you can't. You can't make anything new up. Source already made it all up. We're just tapping into what's there. So release yourself from feeling responsible for making everything up. It's not necessary. You're just tapping into what's there. Then you're going to discern using a three-step process. Use those three minds of yours. They're going to serve you greatly to discern the truth. You're going to ask yourself, if it's a decision between two things, then you can ask yourself, what are the pros and cons of these two actions? If it's way too many actions to choose from, you can say, where's my mindset at at the moment? How's my mind doing about this? If it's looking for a pattern or looking for information, you can use that as a framework question. What do I need to know the most about blank right now? And you can ask your brain mind to help you with these, this, and that's what the brain mind's good at. What do I need to know about the subject I'm looking at right now? And the brain's going to help you to see that beyond itself using its wisdom, using the knowledge it has there, right? You're going to ask, what are the pros and cons of these two actions? Or where is my mindset at that would help me to filter through the myriad of choices I have at the moment to make in this moment? come true through action right then you're going to drop into the heart that was just the first step then you're going to drop into the heart how does it feel when i'm imagining doing one of these two choices does it feel good when i imagine this does it feel good when i imagine doing this so that's for when you have two choices let's say you've got tons of choices in front of you how does it feel right now? How am I feeling right now from my heart space? What myriad of choices really lights up for me? Maybe I'm feeling really creative. So all the creative tasks light up for me. Maybe I'm feeling really analytical. So all the analytical tasks light up in front of me. And then of course, when you're dealing with uh, the other pieces, which is going to be all the different co-creating in the moment. What's the action that I can use in the moment? How does it feel to work with that action, right? So you're gonna use what your brain mind showed you, but you're gonna keep asking, well then, and now how does it feel? Not what do I think about it? How does it feel when I'm thinking about these different pieces that I can take part in? Then you're gonna ask your gut. All right, gut, how do you feel? How does the gut in the body feel? How do your organs feel? How does the whole physical body feel? Let's say your gut has these two choices, right? In discernment, choices perhaps about believing some information or not. You can ask your gut, gut, is this information true? Is this option for my activities is this the one that feels the best? Is this, is this going to help me survive and thrive in harmony on the earth? And, you know, or how does my body feel about all these different myriad of choices? How does my gut feel when I imagine doing this creative project or doing this analytical project? And so what you're looking for is your brain mind, your heart mind, and your gut mind to be on board with whatever information, activity, person, place, or thing, or outcome is in front of you to choose from or to act on. So this is a very straightforward way to do discernment. It takes minutes to play with. 
with big, huge, grand decisions like moving or relationships. Should I date this guy or not? Is this woman the right person for me? Well, what we've been taught over the years is to go and ask other people. We literally like interview all of our friends and family, right? If we're lucky to have friends and family that are there to have those answers. If we're not, sometimes maybe we end up going to pay somebody. Hey, Elizabeth, you're a seer. Can you see, is this man right for me? Well, yeah, sure. Sure, I could see that, but, but I won't. I won't do that. I refuse to do that. Instead, I'm gonna teach you to decide for yourself. What are the pros and cons about being with this person? How does it feel? When you imagine being with this person, how does it really feel? And what does your gut say? When you ask your gut, is this the right person for me to date right now? What's your gut say? Maybe your gut says, I don't know, not so sure. Maybe everything thinks comes out correct. Like it's a lot more pros to hang out with this person than cons, right? It's a lot more pros to move here than over here. Your heart says, yeah, that feels really good. But the gut's like, I don't know, I'm not sure. Well, that's okay. The gut might say that it doesn't know or that it's not sure or, or it'll clench up because it needs more information. Maybe that person hasn't paid for any of the meals on your dates yet and you've been paying. So how does your gut know that they're gonna be a, somebody that will help you survive? Huh? Someone that will help you thrive that's gonna carry their weight out in the world, right? Out in nature <laughs> where we're trying to reconnect. And so that's something you're going to notice. Sometimes you need more information. Well, I haven't actually walked around that town very much. I don't really know, you know, how that house really feels at night because I haven't been there at night. So I don't know. Uh, you know, the gut needs more information about things. So you're going to keep moving forward with gathering more info. It goes the same with any opinions as well, political opinions, scientific opinions. Those opinions could feel good or maybe they don't feel good. And your gut's gonna have, I need more info. I'm not ready to make a decision about that, right? If the heart says no or shuts down or clenches up, it's often because it's afraid. It's afraid that something bad that happened with perhaps a relationship or a moving situation or a choice or information that ended up being wrong maybe, that that doesn't feel good because trauma is there. So you're gonna notice that, oh, my heart's traumatized when I think about dating anybody, even when it all makes sense that all the pros in the world are there, but my heart, it's, it's saying, oh, it, I don't know. It, doesn't feel right to me because I'm not ready. Or the heart hasn't had the experience it needs yet to say, you know what? It's not going to be like it was before. But that's also important because the heart's not causing you to then have to go back and relive all your trauma. Your heart just knows how it feels in the moment. The heart is very present and it can function from your body memory. In fact, the perfect body memory is all functioning from the heart space, not the brain. So the heart space remembers everything much better than any other brain in your body. And the heart says, I don't know, you've been in like five relationships and they were horrible. So I'm not feeling very good about it, even though all the pros are there. And I need help. I need more information. I need more time. I need more healing before I can make that yes choice, right? So that's really key to just notice that the heart and the gut and the mind are not always on the same page. We would love that to happen, but the heart and the gut are going to let you know when there's more work to do. And it's not just going to be your brain mind making these decisions and discerning what the right action in the moment is, what the right information is, what the right step is what is 
going on in your life, discerning reality, right? Your main greatest tool to do that is your body. And your body can serve you very straightforward in making these very clear decisions. And so that's why the class was about healing and discernment because healing is really on the table right now and very important, but discernment, we must discern, we must discern consent. We must discern empowerment. We must discern if we're in competition or creating or cultivating dependency or not in the actions we take from here on out, including in ourselves, right? Awesome. So then I want to talk about manifesting. It's very similar. So we're going to build on this, right? It's very similar to the discernment process. When we manifest, we can't just imagine something into existence. There's a three-step process to true manifestation. And it creates a lot of wonderful options for action when you're doing real manifestation. So let's talk about it in the terms of relationships, right? So as you're trying to manifest a better relationship or you're manifesting perhaps a co-creative relationship with someone for business or a relationship with a new place to work from or any kind of information that you're wanting to manifest, any kind of relationship, any objects, all kinds of different things. Remember, objects don't show up without relationships, though. <laughs> money doesn't show up without relationships. And money can't just sit there and stay in its state. Money is simply there to get the ball rolling to turn into other stuff. Either, you know, electricity, water, relationships, food, health, all kinds of different things. So... We don't want to imagine having a whole bunch of money and that's it. That's not going to work. That money is not going to stay in that form. We need to know what kind of form it, it's going to become, really. And that's us really asking, what do I really need from a soul level? What does my body really need right now? Now, with that concept, where am I at? What does my mind need, my heart need, my gut need? What does my body, my soul need right now? When we have that clarity, then we can work to manifest so we can ask our mind, what does that look like? When I imagine this receiving of this really beautiful relationship with people, places, and things uh, in order to create this outcome that I'm thinking is going to be a useful outcome. And so how does that look exactly? And you're looking at how does the outcome look, right? And how does the process look as a whole thing? You want to see the whole equation, not just the outcome. So you want to imagine you and that moment, all these different things happening, people, places, things, actions, and the outcome that you're shooting for, which you're going to release in the end because that is a timeline that we've just described, right? And there's billions of timelines and they're all perfect. They're all perfect. And so we're not going to attach ourselves to an outcome, but we need to start with an outcome to get the momentum rolling, to get the potential rolling for the manifestation. We have to imagine the whole thing. So once you've got that in your mind, you're imagining it to be so, and then you're going to ask yourself, how does it feel when I imagine this unfolding like this? How does it feel? Oh, it feels really good. Okay. Once you know what the frequency of that is, then your body is mapping to the frequency. And this is then where you're going to act on it it's going to be physical so the gut mind you're going to ask the gut mind what's the right next step in this moment for me to take action right now what's the right next step in this moment to take action the gut knows and the gut's going to say well i'm too tired or i'm hungry and i'm thirsty and you need to feed me first before we act or 
here's all the exact things that I can come up with that you could start doing at the moment. And then you go write them down in your to-do list. And then you say, where's my mind at? Where's it, my heart at? Where's my gut at? Which one of these really lights up to me that I can start now, that I want to start now? And then you begin. Now, that at that point, once you've begun, you must release yourself from the attachment to the outcome you had just been imagining. Because it's like fishing. <laughs> You've got to release the line to go out and then grab the fish. You can't hang on to that line. You must release it. You don't see the hook under the water. You don't see the exact timeline that's going to actually be the one that unfolds. None of us can see that. And if somebody says they can, they're picking one for you. Don't let anybody pick one for you. Source picks one through your actions each moment, through your constant checking in with your body, your mind, heart, and gut, and what it's perceiving for you each moment, right? So in order to get the flow going, you have to, after having imagined the outcome, let it go <laughs> and release it. Maybe do something really nice like, dear heart, please release myself from this outcome that I've imagined fully. Any attachment I have to that precise outcome and how it got there, I release myself from that. Source, I give it to you. I give it to you to pick the exact right perfect timeline. Because I know what, what I'd really like to happen, but the power is in the allowance of each moment to unfold, not in the controlling of our ideas of the future. So in manifesting, yes, you do need to be able to imagine the process and the outcome but you will not remain clinging to it or hoping that's going to occur in each action. Instead, you're going to relieve yourself of any attachment from it. And that's the end of expectations. That's the end of, ex that's the end of attachment. So that you can allow the right, exact, perfect next steps to be unfolded in your experience in the moment each moment and allow the beautiful kaleidoscope of perfect timelines even the ones that we say that we don't like or don't want are perfect my friends because when has anyone ever been able to see the full and complete and total precise precision end and creation of any reality you can't because that's all reality it ends up looping back on itself right we won't get too confusing there. <laughs> but that's the beauty of manifestation is that you're not only in surrender, you're also in full action mode, making sure each moment continues to help unfold the greater sense of accomplishment in each moment, the greater sense of action in each moment, right? And that's the paradigm of empowerment. Because as you're doing this, it also influences the relationships you have with the people, places, and things around you. Then you're not so attached to your expectations and outcomes that you can't see the great and wonderful, interesting options and loopholes and twists and turns that reality wants to give you. And then you're not going to box yourself in, just like you're not boxing yourself in with a single purpose. You're not going to box yourself in with a single timeline or an outcome either, even in manifesting. Awesome. So I want to address healers, healers and what you can be focusing on right now to heal, right? So healers, the number one thing you need to be doing at the moment is healing yourself. Because to be the great beings of empowerment and to be fully empowered is to be an example for a roadmap for a conscious frequency for 
healing, right? And this can apply to any of you who have specific skills. So maybe I could also apply this to seers, being a seer or an empath, right? But especially in healing or doing any work with or for anyone around you, any person place around you, you need to always have addressed your own healing. Part of why I'm even bringing it up is because I know I'm terrible at it. I'm terrible at healing myself. And someone asked, what about artists? Oh yeah. Here, here, ask yourself as a creative person, right? Can you make the most profound, beautiful, light-filled art when you are in a state of illness of any type, mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual? Is that the point of your art? And then, of course, if the point of your art is actually to heal yourself, I, I'm an artist too, and my art is there to help me heal. I don't do art to give to or show other people. So art is there as a process for me to heal. So when I use my art as a tool, it's a healing tool. And so I'm painting weird stuff, you know? Some of it's pretty dark, to be honest. My music is pretty sad. <laughs> my artwork is pretty weird. But it's there for me as a vessel for my healing. So I put all of that processing out into the art so that it can be understood by me better. So it doesn't have power over me anymore, right? And then, of course, art can also be healing for others. Certainly. But if we need to use it as a tool for our own healing, we can do that first. And then perhaps it creates something that might help others heal, right? But either way, working on you every day, you need to consider, how am I doing? What do you need, Elizabeth? What do you need today? I remember finally after 14 different psychologists, I had really extreme PTSD. Some of you know my story. And 14 different psychologists the last one who actually helped me the most actually asked me after about six months actually asked me, Elizabeth, what is it that you really need? Because all the techniques he kept trying to apply to me, like a, like a template, like a one size fits all wasn't working, which is why I had 14 different psychologists. And I'm not joking, literally 14 different people. <laughs> so, um, and and many of them said, I'm sorry, I can't help you, which wasn't true, because if they had been more co-creative and empowering, we would have found a way. And that's what this guy did. After six months of this no size, one size doesn't fit Elizabeth, <laughs> he asked me, what is it that you really need? And I realized in that moment, no one had asked me that. Not one of those 14 people until him after six months of working with him had ever asked me that. So that's one of the most profound questions we can ask every day. What does my body need right now? What does my soul need? My mind, my emotional body. What does my ego need? Ego is not you, but you can learn from ego. Ego might need you to work with it a little bit that day and talk to it. You can separate ego from yourself and talk to your ego and you'll find, oh, that's when my brain seems to like take control. It's actually ego because the ego has needs that haven't been met, right? The ego's maintaining those different traumatized versions of you who have not got their needs met. So we can work with that. And we work with it in certain ways, like healing the traumatized inner child that is running the show or healing the traumatized teenager or the 20-some, 30-some, healing the version of you from last week who had a lot of trauma around a lockdown or whatever, right? So all those traumatized versions of you, they build up. That's 
part of ego structure. Ego structure then creates things like expectations, attachments, judgment, especially of yourself, right? We can work with ego. We can ask, what does my ego need right now that I can work with right now? Maybe there's a trigger or something that's showing up. So for you healers, ask yourself this every day and diligently work on it. Allow space to let your mind, your heart, and your body be inspired in a healing process for yourself every day. Make it creative. Pick different random things that you've never done before. Maybe grab an adult coloring book and allow that to be healing. Whatever it is, try something new every day. That way you don't get bored and, and stuck in this, oh, I got to do healing some more on myself, right? <laughs> Good. And so the other thing I wanted um, people to address as healers, as artists, as seers, as empaths is going through your three minds regularly. Eventually, as you talk to your brain, heart, and gut, you'll get used to it and you'll feel like your whole body's actually functioning as one. It's a very cool feeling to feel that. So your whole body will function as one it can make a really big difference. And when you're able to hang out in that position, of being aware of your three minds all the time, you're training your body and your mind to naturally consider how does my mind, heart, and gut feel right now? So you're training your body to do it on its own, and it doesn't take that long for your body to start functioning brain, mind, gut all the time. Brain, heart, gut, excuse me. Brain, mind, heart, mind, gut, mind all the time. As healers, you can be doing that as well, and it applies very nicely to, of course, discernment, manifestation, and this whole paradigm shift, right, into freedom. Then I want people to consider as healers looking at the needs of the soul in the person, place, or thing that's in front of you. So like the earth, she's got a soul, right? So anywhere you go on the earth, you're on her body and she has a soul. So you can powwow with mother earth and Gaia, which is the name of her soul, right? You can powwow with Mother Earth Gaia each day in a place if that's what's in your attention and ask soul of the earth, what do you need right now, right? You can ask the soul of the plants or the animals that you're working with. You can ask the soul of the people. And with the people especially, you can say, if I was to ask your soul right now, what do you need the most? That's a wonderful question for us healers to play with because it forces the brain mind to say, oh, what does my soul need? I guess I hadn't considered it like that because we always say, well, what do you need? Well, who are we talking to? Are we talking to the body or the ego? Are we talking to the trauma? We got to say specifically the soul because the soul is the one that is the connect to source and it, that's always connected, right? And so then once you give them that chance, it lifts them up into a vantage point. It heightens their vantage point. What does my soul really want right now? What does it really need right now? Sometimes people don't know, so they need help. And then you can start from there. All right, let's, let's talk about that. How does it, how would it feel to get needs met at a physical level or a mental emotional level what about a spiritual one what does that look like half of healing is asking the right questions isn't it <laughs> and these are the ones that i've discovered over many years really have worked the best to get down to the very very core of the healing that needs to be done and we can do it for ourselves every day what does my soul really want right now not tomorrow, now, right? And then, of course, teaching tools. Teaching tools, don't just do removals. Don't just do clearings and activations. You can teach tools and then do a removal or do a removal and then teach the tools. 
Either way, depends on the situation. You could help someone and activate them and then teach them tools to maintain the strength of that activation. You could be doing healing on someone and then teach them how to do it themselves on themselves. Right. So keep thinking about ways that we can empower the people and the places and the things that we're working with. No matter what you're doing, whether you're a healer, artist, seer, empath, creator, you are always a creator being and you're all of those things. <laughs> and that's the cool part. All of us can see, feel and know the truth. And we all have access to all skill sets if we don't narrow ourselves down into a box of purpose, right? And that's the awesome, beautiful part. Then it's much more free to say, well, right now I'm an artist and I'm using this art to heal myself. That's what my soul needs right now. How wonderful that we can do that, right? Beautiful. Now, the last piece I want to give you is what do we need to be healing right now? What do we need to heal right now? I'm gonna give you some layers to consider. And so these layers will pop up all the time. They're gonna pop up in different ways around you. And it doesn't mean that all those things have to be attended to all at once. I think you'll see what I mean when I talk about these layers. First, the first layer that'll be the most obvious that needs to often be addressed right away before you can do anything more is personal trauma. So how do you know what is personal trauma? When you get triggered, when there's a reaction, right? So let me give myself as an example. The other day, my husband read something from mass media and said, well, it must be true. It was on this mass media channel, right? And, and I knew that it wasn't true. <laughs> and so I, I knew in myself, my discernment was saying that it wasn't true, but I got triggered big time. First off, I was not hydrated. I had not eaten any food. So I was not in any good state to be aware of my trigger very well. And I actually yelled at him and I never do that. And so it was very rare, but I got triggered and I yelled at him and I'm like, why are you reading me this stuff? It's not even true, right? Poor guy. <laughs> so here I just projected all my trigger right back at him. And it had nothing to do with him, of course, or the information, it was me. It was my reaction and my trigger, right? And then I caught myself, right? Oh boy, I'm triggered. And so I said, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have yelled at you. And that was not okay. Please forgive me. We moved on, right? But I thought, okay, I've got some healing to do, right? So in that moment, mind, heart, gut says, you need to look at this trigger. So you go in, you find that trigger, right? You find the trigger, you go and follow it. So I followed my trigger. I'm angry. I'm angry about lies. And it's not just media lies. It's, it's lies that exist. Lies make me angry. I've been hurt by lies, right? And this is my ego speaking and my, my heart speaking. Lies have hurt me. So I go in and I say, how does it feel to be hurt by lies? That's the frequency of the distortion of the personal trauma there, right? I don't need to know every single lie that hurt me. That would be crazy. My, my, my heart does. My mind doesn't need to know that. And then I allow the frequency of lies. I welcome this frequency of lies, right? So then it becomes revealed. Now I know the frequency of it. It can't hurt me. It can't hurt my soul. It can't hurt me this frequency, now I know it. Now it loses power over me. So by welcoming it, finding it in my body, oh, it feels like lies are here, like a big heavy metal plate, a lead plate right here. I welcome this frequency of lies right here. <sighs> right? And then it 
unravels because all it was was trauma. It was personal trauma. It was my consciousness under pressure. No more lies, right? <laughs> I want truth. I want justice. I want candor. I want transparency. So then I can replace that. I can replace that trauma. Dear heart, lift all of these traumas from lies that I've now revealed, right? You've sifted through it, so now it's ready to go. You know it, so it's ready to go. Lift all these traumas from lies that are ready to go out of my whole body and field now. Then you take a big deep breath and replace it, dear heart, replace it with the light of truth, candor, justice, and transparency now. And what I've done now is I've chose to learn from my trigger, my personal trauma. I've chose to address it right in that moment. And you can do that quite swiftly, even in your mind, wherever you're at. And even again, maybe taking some time later on in the day to do it doesn't mean you have to do it all in that moment, right? But find yourself, am I mentally, in my heart space, in my body space, am I able to do this process right now? Maybe not. That's okay. You'll check in later, but now you know there's a trigger there. And now you know that the personal trauma can be addressed. That's always the first thing that often needs to be seen. When you go through a lot of these, and so I was saying, I don't get triggered that much because I've done this for so long, um, over a decade straight, being able to address these things that when a trigger shows up, it's not that often for me. And when it does, I'm like, wow, okay, good. I've got something new personally that I could address. But that doesn't mean that I'm done, right? Because there's other layers to address. There's going to be, of course, the layer of the collective and that can show up in your family can show up in your friends group it can show up in your client group it can show up just tapping into the collective right so for example right now big huge trauma in the collective around plagues plagues and famine big trauma there that makes sense that's collective trauma. Everyone's afraid of that. And many of us have experienced people dying from things tragically, a lot of different layers of trauma in the collective that need to be addressed. So we can ask ourselves, how does that feel? How does it feel to have trauma from plagues and famine or from the loss of family members or friends that we loved? How does it feel, this collective trauma and fear around death? How is it in me? and then addressing it within yourself first to see if you're triggered by it. Then you go through the baggage of it that's being triggered. And then that also goes out to the collective. Anything from the collective, you can find it in yourself because it's in your awareness. It's going to ping something in you. And then when you do the process in yourself, you can release it through the self out to the rest of the collective. Dear collective, I have processed this in this light of candor and transparency, justice and truth is yours. I give it to you and we let our heart space get really big and connect to all these beautiful beings, the collective of the planet, and we give them the process, the light, the end result of the process, the healing process, right? The third layer is going to be the lineage. Sometimes the collective and the lineage, they work together in those layers of trauma. Fear from plague and famine in the collective is most certainly going to be also found in the lineage, which is your epigenetic body memory. That body memory does not belong to you. It only belonged to you for as long as you've been in this body. So if you're 55, that body memory is 55 years old until it goes beyond that, which is all the memories of your ancestors. We're talking a lot of people. 
a lot of people. It's kind of like its own collective. Well, you can be working with the lineage trauma as well. So if you've gone through your personal baggage enough, there's still going to be more with the goal of access to your whole DNA. So if the house is the body, the body is the house that you've inherited, right? Filled with trash bags, blocking you from access to all dimensions. Now, that DNA was created for two reasons. One, to access all dimensions at once instead of having to bounce between them and only hang out in one at a time. And two, to have body memory. In fact, the fact that lineage trauma is built up in the whole house for all these eight eons, that lineage trauma is there, is actually a function of the whole reason why DNA exists, which is to access memory. Not just your soul's memory, which you can access for sure by cleaning up the baggage that's blocking the access to the dimensions, but also the memory of your ancestors, the knowledge and wisdom they had, right? Not just the trauma. So if you're aware of, okay, well, I might not be a drug addict, but all my uncles are, or <laughs> all my aunts are, or maybe I'm not a narcissist, but my father was, or maybe my, my aunt was, right? Those are traumas that have been built up that are in your genetic memory because of the relatives that came before you. And that's normal, but it doesn't have to stay there. So as you've cleaned up your personal trauma, now you're getting into the deeper stuff. And when you get through that stuff, you're getting access to much, much more beautiful, bright levels of dimensions. It's like a big open plan floor room that every time you move more trash out of the way, every time you work on the lineage, you're getting access to more of those rooms, which are those dimensions. And they're not separate. And they're also not higher than each other. They're all available. And the idea is to have access. The more access you have, the more soul memory you have, the more memory from your lineage you have, and the more the powerful the more powerful, excuse me, all of your actions in the now can be because you're backed by all of those dimensions, all that light, all that knowledge, all that wisdom. And then the next layer that must be shifted, but I want to show you how do you do a cleanup of lineage stuff? If you know what you want to clean up, you're discovering it along the way through triggers, through collective memory, but you'll discover more and more through a lot of different forms, perhaps even dreams, perhaps memories that become more clear, that weren't clear before. Then once you know what you're naming, you're going to basically modify a heart command to help you shift all of that. So you're going to feel those different frequencies. So like, let's say you want to deal with the drug addiction part, right? You'd feel the frequency of drug addiction within you. It's written in your DNA. It's right there. It's not yours. It's just available in the trauma that's built up in the epigenetic memory. So you'll feel it. And then you'll say, dear heart, I welcome all my lineage to stand with me and receive this healing right now. And then you'll feel that presence. They all will stand behind you. And you can say, dear heart, Please lift the trauma from my body and field and the bodies and fields of all my ancestors of any drug addiction now. And then you take a big deep breath. And then you're going to choose what to replace it with, right? So now a whole bunch of trash bags just left, not just one, lots of trash bags, right? From all the different people in your lineage who might have had drug addiction. Then you're gonna replace it with light. Dear heart, please fill my body and field and the bodies and fields of my lineage with pure unconditional self-love now. And take a big deep breath. And now what you've done is you've given all that space 
pure light so that nothing can return, nothing can take its place that you haven't given consent. And so the only thing you gave consent to give it, to replace it with was pure unconditional self-love, right? And that gives you more access to your house every day. And it also, what does it do? It mirrors back out to the collective and it helps the collective. Whether you've talked to anybody about it or not, doesn't matter. Your heart feels intimately connected to the earth and the people, mind, heart, and gut, all of the beautiful Indra's net deeply connected to all of it. So anything you do is informing the collective by its manifestation because you've just done it. So it is very good. And then the last layer, which is one we don't consider very often. And right now it's being cleaned up really big time. And after this, we'll all take some questions. Is the earth's trauma, my friends, the earth's trauma. That's being cleaned up too. And it's in our bodies. How? How is the earth's trauma written in our bodies? Well, beyond DNA, what is DNA made of? It's made of different elements, certain specific molecules, right? It's made of light and it's made of water. Water that has come from the earth. Water that has always been on this planet since the beginning of her existence. Water holds memory. The function of DNA to retain memory comes from water. Water is the Earth's memory and our bodies are deeply connected to it. And our experiences are connected to the Earth's body through the water. She's receiving our memories every day. She's giving us memories every day in the drinks that we drink, right? In the foods that we eat. And these memories, they didn't go anywhere. The oceans are full of the memories of all the events of the earth and all the wars and all the drama and all the beauty and the love and the creation and the dinosaurs and ancient memory. And that memory is being cleared too, especially now because the earth is doing exactly what I've just talked about you doing today. The earth is empowering us. She's empowering us by healing herself first. And in this healing, there's a big amount of purging going on. It's very physical for us. So if your skin's been going wild and your body and your stomach and for months now, probably, maybe even much longer, very sensitive, right? To what's going on. And then the doctors, they say, well, we don't really know what's wrong with you, <laughs> right? Or you try to go see, seek, for, seek help. Well, and then the purging keeps happening. The clearing keeps happening because it's not, you you're not alone you're not a bubble you're not an island it's also the earth doing it too especially now that she's embodying these higher dimensions so as she gets more access to her house it brightens the room it brightens the entirety of the planet earth the schumann resonance shoots up and the collective is changed and then the collective structures get changed and all this crumbling of corruption and density, crumbling of what has simply been consciousness under pressure all this time. It is the giant grand earth clearing and healing that's happening as well. So we can welcome that. You don't have to do anything special unless you want to, and you can ask Earth, what can I do for you today? How can I help you? How can I help you heal today, Mother Earth? You can ask her and she'll tell you. If you'd like to take part in that, you can help her clear with your heart space. Dear heart, please lift any trauma that needs to be shifted out of Mother Earth, my heart, my body and my field, and her body and field that I can help with, let it shift out of us now. And then take a deep breath. 
So your heart space, you know, it touches the planet. We lift whatever needs to be lifted. We allow our field to be a conduit for that. We match up with it by allowing it in ourselves too. And then we can replace it. Dear heart, please fill my body and field and the body and field of the earth now with unconditional love in perfect equanimity and the light of empowerment now. The deep breath. And in that, we can serve the earth. We can also help ourselves. And we can continue to open up the beautiful process of finding our true state of enlightenment, which is pure empowerment. Pure empowerment. Power is light. Light is power. Empowerment means light. Being light, embodiment of light, right? And we have a name for that. It's enlightenment. So we're helping the earth. We're helping our lineage. We're helping the collective. We're helping ourselves do what we had originally said at the very beginning, growth, evolution, right? We're helping by doing that, focusing in the now, not allowing the box of purpose to narrow us down, not allowing trauma to block us, but to learn from it, to understand it, to know it, so it has no power over us. Being then, of course, willing to share these tools and modify them if needed to continue to co-create healing in the people, places, and things that come into our attention every moment, remaining in this moment. You are the creator of new earth. You are that right now. And it's not the future that you are. You are creating new earth now. The future will unfold from there. And you can trust that fully and be able to discern and manifest using your whole body now. So thank you. Thank you so much for letting me share these tools with you today. So this is a free mastery empowerment course to introduce people to your teachings. And I want to say, I feel really empowered listening to you. The manifestation um, surrendering it, allowing it to unfold, not being attached to it, and then the whole process of really feeling with our body. All of us are just loving that information. So thank you for that. Let's talk a little bit about the ways that people can work with you. You have a whole bunch of teachings, and this is an extended course, an advanced course for those who are ready and for those who wish to go deeper in all that you've talked about. So please explain that, what you've got here. And I'm gonna put this link for everyone in our um, box here, in our chat line. Absolutely, so I'm really excited to offer um, two different packages to help people and they're both advanced packages and i've been calling them light discernment and healing empowerment training so i pulled together all these different special pieces in order to help fulfill some very specific things for you first i want you to feel capable of true discernment i touched on that to a certain extent extent i do want you to be able to really trust yourself fully my intent with these packages is to help you continue your journey in that discernment i want you to know what to heal and how exactly i want you to be able to understand exactly the things that cause you blocks and illness because they're very specific they're known and i want you to be able to receive very detailed training on power and light and specific I want you to be able to understand polarities and fear and how you can really use that to advance yourself. And lastly, I want you to feel like you can connect to a community that has no judgment, that's really supportive, that's in equanimity, that's practicing the power and par par empowerment paradigm. Oh boy, say that fast. So package A is over 20 hours of instant access classes. First, I'm giving you access to a special class called Quantum Healing for Infectious Disease. 
I train you. If you've never done quantum healing before, it doesn't matter. I train you how to do it. And then I walk you through and apply it to all infectious diseases. That one is four hours long. Then there's discernment and discrimination spiritual training. How to discern, how to discriminate when it comes to the spiritual realm. We were really talking about discernment in general, but the spiritual realm, there's some really great tips and tools that I teach you to use to be able to do spiritual discernment too, whether you feel like you can see well or not, or feel well or not, feel energy or not you'll be able to be trusting yourself better with spiritual discernment from there as well. That one's three hours long. And then I have a multidimensional mastery course set. It's four classes. One is full body discernment, which is the complete class on full body discernment technique that I touched on today. The second one is healing polarities. How exactly do you heal polarities? Why are they important? Why are they sometimes feeling like a big block, how do you fix that? And then creating and maintaining spiritual power. Power is light, light is power. How do you create more? How do you maintain it? And then spiritual etiquette and equanimity. How do you function in the world as a spiritual being with great honor and etiquette and, and of course, respect and, uh, and love for all beings, non-judgment? How do you do that? I teach you in that class as well. Each of those are between two to three hours long. And the last piece of that package is a one-year subscription to come join me on my calls each month. At the end of the month, at the last Sunday of the month, I like to get together with you. And we come together as a community in non-judgment and love to connect each month at the end of the month. So that's a whole year subscription to those calls. The second package includes all of that plus a 30 minute personal session and a group call, but there's only 10 available of this one because I can't give away all my session times. <laughs> um, otherwise I wouldn't ever stop doing sessions, but you can use these really strategically. We could either do your 30 minute one on one and really go really deep into something that you really need. And then follow up on a group call, which is very profound. And then you get to hear all these other people's readings. Most people that join me on the group calls say they absolutely love them even more than one on ones, honestly. So you could do that or you could do a group call first and a one on one second. Either way, then you get nearly an hour of personal readings from me to help you discern whatever it is that you're facing and then get you empowered to do the right next step and manifest what is needed from whatever it is that you've experienced. So I'm very glad to offer those two things for everyone and your continued evolution and growth, your discernment, your healing. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth Wood. That's a beautiful offering and it really helps all of us as we embark on new earth now. Beautiful lessons. Thank you. And thank you all for listening as well. Mm, namaste.